I'm looking for more of this, please. This is the Robo Incala 2-in-1 Windows 11 laptop. Robo Incala are sponsoring this video to talk about Windows on ARM. And immediately, I can't shake the obvious comparison. I recently reviewed the Surface Pro 9 5G. That was running a chip Microsoft called the SQ3. The SQ3 is built by Qualcomm and is based on a Snapdragon chip. The same Snapdragon chip that's in this the Robo Incala. I feel the Robo Incala has a very specific target in its sights. It's clearly built to compete with the Surface Pro 9. I usually don't like turning sponsored conversations or even my reviews into direct product comparisons, but this one's a little different. It's so directly built to compete against a specific machine, I feel we can use the Surface Pro 9 as something of a baseline. I think that's fair. Windows on ARM. Can we make a nice thin Windows laptop with better battery life? Yes. Yes, we can. The experience has evolved well, and there are fewer and fewer instances where I feel consumers are going to run into deal breakers. Fewer areas where you're going to hit that wall, and you genuinely can't get a task finished. When Windows on ARM first arrived, we saw all the headlines about how rough it was, how incomplete it was. And if you're searching for current info today, we still have to sift through all of those old reviews and editorials. The memory of the internet is long, and it's tricky getting current information on some of these machines. Over the last couple years, I think consumer behavior has changed. App developers have a different focus on making services more web-enabled and more portable, and Microsoft has improved Windows 11, especially, specifically, Windows on ARM. So we get to the Robo Incala, and this modular system makes a lot of sense. Running down the specs, we've got the aforementioned Qualcomm chip paired with 16 gigabytes of RAM and 512 gigabytes of storage. This screen is a pretty OLED at 60 hertz, in a 16 by 10 aspect ratio. The Surface Pro 9 has a slightly higher resolution LCD at 120 hertz and with a 15 by 10 aspect ratio that's 3 by 2 for folks who like to reduce their fractions. Both have Windows Hello face unlock. Both feature a pair of USB-C ports that can support charging and video output. We get similar 2-watt stereo speakers on each system. The Surface Pro 9 supports Wi-Fi 6E over this tablet's Wi-Fi 6, but the Robo Incala has Bluetooth 5.2 over the Surface's Bluetooth 5.1. The Surface has the larger 46-watt hour battery to the Robo Incala's 41-watt hour, but both support 65-watt charging. Now, the Surface has that magnetic charger that's proprietary to Surface uh, tablets and laptops. The Robo Incala uses is this side as a place to hold and charge the stylus. We're talking about a Surface Pro 9 competitor, so of course it has a built-in kickstand and with access to the SSD. Users can easily upgrade the storage here, which is often a pain point on other nice thin laptops. And both use pogo pins and magnets to connect cases and keyboards. They're very similar. But while the Surface takes a few wins, like the faster refresh rate display and the larger battery, and the Pro 9 includes that 5G radio, the Robo Incala is Wi-Fi only, but it's attacking aggressively on price. Put this whole system together. The tablet and the keyboard and a stylus, this 2-in-1 is nearly half the price of a Surface Pro 9 with discounts, and I have a link in the description below so you can see current bundles and offers from Robo Incala. Matching the RAM and storage on the Surface Pro 9, including the keyboard and the Microsoft Surface Pen, we're looking at roughly $2,100. It's definitely not an oranges-to-oranges -oranges fight, but it's so close we can appreciate the differences and the small compromises at play, there will totally be people who just need that 5G connectivity built into a tablet. There are going to be a lot of folks who are fine just tethering to their phone. This hardware is great. I like the green metallic shell. Windows Hello works great. It's super fast. It gets you logged in quick. The screen is really pretty. Now, I did an unboxing on Patreon, and I couldn't immediately tell if it was running at 120 hertz. I think Microsoft is doing a very good job of polishing up animations and transitions throughout the Windows UI. But of course, putting it side by side, a tablet or a phone at 90 or 120 hertz, you can see those other screens are smoother, a little sleeker. That's really going to come down to the individual use cases. I don't know that 120 20 hertz matters as much for document work, for presentations, or for media streaming. <laughs> Watching a movie at 24 or 30 frames per second, you're not really using 120 hertz on your screen. And these tablets, whether they're ARM powered or x86, AMD or Intel powered, they usually aren't high recommendations for hardcore gameplay. So a smoother UI is appreciated, but the practical use of the tablet isn't 
overly impacted by only having a 60 hertz display. The flip side against a Surface Pro 9, the screen can crank a little brighter than that Surface Pro, and that makes it a bit more useful in travel and outdoor use. As something I love on the Surface Pro 9, and I adore it here too, the kickstand is wonderful. I love this flexibility. You can angle it almost totally flat, or you can prop it up for a more laptop-like experience. After you get used to this being built into the case, it makes every other tablet a little harder to use for when you want to go slate only. But you also want to be able to put your tablet down. You always need to have a case or a stand with those other tablets. The build quality on this thing is just gorgeous. Overall, lighter and thinner than the Surface Pro 9, and given the smaller battery, runtime has been in a close ballpark with my experiences using that SQ3. Every manufacturer has a different different system for rating their battery life. It's confusing and it's frustrating. I think it's really annoying. So when Microsoft says up to 19 hours for the Surface Pro 9, it's a little different than comparing the Robo and Kala estimate of around 20 hours on their tablet. It's a bunch of different mixed mode scenarios. And I don't believe Microsoft includes 5G use in their testing, at least not according to their support FAQ. And it also means setting the screen brightness to about a third of its total maximum brightness. Trying to test like that real world, like here in the Gadget Lab when I'm really using it, that's maddening. I mean, especially just for things like, I like turning up the screen brightness, it's a really juicy display. But for those reported advertised differences, the Robo and Kala is one of the longest lived Windows machines I've ever used. Plus when you're running low, the charge speed here is a breath of fresh air compared to Apple and Android tablets. Only the new OnePlus pad is gonna hang with this charge speed at 65 watts. You don't have to stay plugged in long to get a significant amount of runtime out in the field. And I also wanna shout out the key keyboard differences. Okay, so the Surface has this cool soft hinge that can pop onto the tablet bezel, give your keyboard a bit of an angle, it helps with typing, and it also houses the stylus charging pad. It's pretty trick. The Robo and Kala has a hard hinge, and this all stays flat on the table. I don't like the angle for typing as much, but the Robo and Kala keyboard is dual use. There's a little battery in here, and it will auto-connect over Bluetooth to give you a wireless keyboard and mouse. This is super handy. It's great when you might want to connect the tablet to another display or to a TV, but then you might want to move around or work at a different distance. You don't immediately need to turn to another wireless keyboard and mouse. You've got a keyboard and trackpad ready to go. Plus with backlit keyboards, just like a Surface keyboard, we've got pretty good key travel. It's got a nice feel though. I personally wouldn't mind something just a little clickier. I think this is a handy use it out in public keyboard keyboard that's quiet enough to not bother other people around you. I just like having laptops with clacky gamer keys on them because I'm annoying like that. I mentioned losing the proprietary magnetic charger, but we're borrowing a bit from an iPad Pro here. The side of the tablet has this magnetic latch and the stylus charges off of this side panel. Simple pen it looks a little like a certain company's pencil. The button's out of the box. The front is your erase key and the rear is your right click option, but Windows typically vaults to a long press for the right click throughout most of the UI. This gives the Surface Pen a bit of an edge for things like launching apps and having Bluetooth connectivity for other features and shortcuts. But while this is simpler, the thing I like about the Robo and Kala option, it's a Windows Ink compatible stylus. So I have a Wacom Bamboo Ink Pen that worked with an old Lenovo and some of my old LG phones, and now it can be a good backup for my Robo and Kala. It's a little frustrating to see other brands today now getting more into selling proprietary pens. I like having options, I like having competition, even down to something like our accessories. Okay, that was, that was a lot of hardware to get through. A tablet is only as good as the software you can run on it. So I totally get all the folks who look at a slate and they only see a companion screen or a second screen to watch movies on, maybe do a little light casual gaming. I completely understand all the folks that don't take mobile slate seriously, but that's not the point of this video. We don't review products to that average consumer level here. We like to see if we can push mobile gear just a little bit farther. The main competitor, Surface Pro 9. Microsoft is confident enough in the experience to slap that Pro label on their ARM tablet. And I think they're absolutely correct. And that confidence extends 
to the Robo and Kala. On its most basic, Microsoft has done an exceptional job of bringing Windows into the touchscreen age. No longer the compromised touched vision of Windows 8 or the backtracking of Windows 10, Windows 11 brings gestures and touch into play in a really delightful way. How start buttons slide into action and multitasking can be snapped and arranged. Fewer and fewer of those instances where you go a menu deep and then you crash into like an old Windows XP style dialog box. It still happens, but it's becoming less and less frequent. It's super familiar for being Windows, but it's really well thought out for moving between mouse, cursor, stylus, and fingertips. No one else has braved this kind of transition, and it's something Apple is woefully behind on trying to balance the use between iPads and MacBooks. I don't think Microsoft gets enough credit for this. It's not easy to do, and we've been watching all of their teething pains, but we're arriving at something that is so much more polished for having that user involvement. So everything I loved about the Surface is on display here. It's a full Windows OS. We look at some of the growth and some of the issues that Android and iPads have had for adding functionality to a mobile operating system. It is kind of funny that it's such a big deal today that we can more easily split screen on Android. Or also that it's such a big deal that we can add a second screen to an iPad with a silly limit on the number of apps you can run. There are no limits here connect a 4K display in Windows goes, yeah, I know what to do with the 4K display, and your Robo Ancala becomes a fully supported dual display that just works. Getting into the actual performance and the operation, we have support for older Windows applications, and I think it's been improving steadily over time. You will see a performance hit compared against a similarly priced Intel or AMD machine, but I find this mostly manifests at application launch. It takes a little longer to start the program, but once it's up in RAM, performance feels pretty close to a last generation Core i5 while using a lot less power. Unlike other consumer tablets using mobile versions, we have full support for Microsoft 365 apps, real Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, full integration with OneDrive and document syncing, it's a real computer, even to the point of getting some decent gaming in. I installed Steam, and I can play through a number of my favorite lighter indie games. You'll want to reduce the screen resolution to 720p, but performance is much better than those older Windows on ARM reviews would have you believe. A lot of the games that I like to play, especially some of those co-op games, completely achievable on this hardware. And for some of those less graphics intense titles, it's going head to head against my Steam Deck and my Razer Edge. Beyond that, there's no reason why you can't fire up a game streaming service like Game Pass. You really wanna tackle something a bit heavier, let some servers, some remote servers, tackle that load and just stream the game to your screen. Just like, any other tablet or phone. The main compatibility issues arrive from more specialty applications. Just like the Surface Pro 9 SQ3, we're using a GPU that cannot be seen by DaVinci Resolve. You can install DaVinci, but you can't run it. So the weak spot for this hardware and software combination is heavy lifting content creation. Cutting a short 1080p HD video in ClipChamp, that's gonna be fine, but this will never be a machine to recommend for folks constantly wanting to edit and upload 4K video out in the field. It's the one area, I mean, I show this off a lot in my phone and tablet reviews, but I think this is the area where an iPad or an Android tablet might be better being able to use an app like LumaFusion. You can get some great work done on LumaFusion, and I bet it would run really well here if we could get some kind of port for this system. Because that's the crazy point I wanna focus on. Windows apps can be a little pokey to launch. I mean, we've covered some of that already, but Windows 11 has subsystems for both Android and Linux. So I have Android installed and Ubuntu installed, and I can launch Android and Linux programs inside Windows 11 without having to dual boot. Against my little Core i5 laptop, launching a program like GIMP in Windows is a lot slower than launching the Linux version of GIMP on the Robo and Kala. Now, the main way you'll use Android apps is through the Amazon App Store, but there are ways to sideload Android APKs, just like any other phone or tablet. Running Android programs were delivering performance comparable and often better to the more premium Android slates out there, and performance for Android apps is generally, but not always, better than running Android apps 
on my Core i5 Pixelbook Go Chromebook. Likewise, Linux applications launch faster and you get more functionality out of a lot of those programs than what we can find in emulating x86, emulating classic Windows programs on an ARM chip. I mentioned we can't use DaVinci Resolve, but we can fire up Kden Live. I don't think the experience is good enough to really warrant this as being a full-time 4K video editing machine, but you can get in there and cut some video if you really want to. There really isn't a better Venn diagram overlap of functionality. Microsoft has quietly included support for a lot of their competitors' applications in a way that's surprisingly functional. It's a little techy to set up, but not so intimidating that I think folks will really struggle with it. And you never need to leave Windows. All of your apps show up alongside your Windows apps. I've been really excited by all the power that we've got in a new phone or a new tablet, but for all of that power in an iPad or an Android tablet, you can't run Windows apps and games. You can't easily install Linux apps. I really tried to drive this point home in my Surface Pro 9 videos, and I need to double down on that again with the Robo and Kala. A similarly feature-complete portable compute experience, this is what's great about seeing competition start to scale up. Windows on ARM is going to be the future of consumer laptops and tablets. The performance per watt is too attractive to pass up. Intel and AMD machines can totally lap this tablet, especially in launching x86 applications, but you're probably gonna need active cooling and you have to use a lot more battery to beat this performance. It's why Apple switched from Intel to Apple Silicon. Apple Silicon is an ARM-based chip. ARM-based chips get better performance per watt than a traditional laptop chip. This is a significant gain for using a computer out in the field and away from a power outlet. Like I said in my Surface Pro 9 videos, I believe this is the first generation of Windows on ARM machines where I feel the benefits of ARM outweigh the compromises for a broad range of consumers. Again, hardcore content creation and video editing or hardcore gaming, probably not. But everything else? It's pretty good. I was very positive on this with the Surface Pro 9, and I'm even more positive on this, being able to undercut the Surface price and the iPad Pro price and the Galaxy Tab price. So now our price to performance per watt is looking really good. A major shout out, a major thank you to Robo and Kala for reaching out and sponsoring this conversation on Windows on ARM. I think this is one of the most exciting areas of mixed mobile computing, and I hope folks keep paying attention to this space. Microsoft is quietly doing some disruptive software work, and we're getting some really fun hardware to play with. If you have any questions, or if you'd wanna see some comparisons outside of this sponsored video, don't be shy. Drop me some of them tasty hot takes down below and maybe smash that bell icon on your way down to the comments. As always, thanks so much for watching, for sharing these videos, subscribing to the channel. All the support lately has been absolutely fantastic. Those of you who are, clicking on links in the descriptions if you're visiting my home site, somegadgetguy.com, or if you're joining the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon. That's patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. That list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the omniverse. So I hope you'll check them out. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet? At some gadget guy. I'm spending some more time on the Mastodons. I'm sharing uh, more of my photos on the Flickr. I stream my podcast on the Twitch. A little less so these days on the Twitters and the Facebooks and the Instagrams. But I will catch you all on the next video.